In December of 1872, an English ship named De Gradia would pull into the British territory of Gibraltar, but it was not alone. In her tow was an abandoned brigantine known as the Mary Celeste, a derelict ship found in the open Atlantic Ocean in unusually good condition. There were no signs of foul play, and it was as if the occupants of the ship had simply vanished into thin air. The simple yet intriguing nature of the story caused wide speculation of the cause over the years, from water spouts and explosions to sea monsters and alien abduction. But what exactly happened to the Mary Celeste to make it one of the most well-known maritime mysteries? Welcome to Ghoul School, where we school you ghouls and tales of the macabre and supernatural. I'm Wes Holiday, and with me is my nautical neighbor, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're going with this episode? Well, um, is this one nautical themed? I think I can uh, I can take a stab at it. Tell oh, me yeah. about it. What are we, what are we talking about we're today? We're talking about a derelict ship. Okay. Known as the Mary Celeste. Oh, the yeah. Mary Celeste. I, I've, I've heard of the story of the Mary Celeste. I know very vaguely about it, but I don't know any of the details. Well, now you're about to know way too much about it. Let's get into it. <laughs> Let's do it. The Mary Celeste was actually not the ship's original name. Her construction began at Spencer's Island, Nova Scotia in 1860, and she was launched on May 18, 1861, christened as the Amazon. The craft was just below 100 feet long, 25 and a half feet wide, and about 12 feet deep, while weighing nearly 200 tons. She was then registered to nine members of a local shipping company. In June, the member Robert McClellan took her out as captain on a maiden voyage to the nearby town of Five Islands. The Amazon was to pick up a cargo of timber destined for London, but McClellan fell ill during the pickup. They returned to Spencer's Island where McClellan died on June 19th. This marked a small stint of unfortunate events that would pave the way for the future of the ship. John Parker took over as captain and would continue the shipment to London, but before leaving North America, they would run into fishing weirs off the coast of Maine and would be delayed several days before continuing the journey. They eventually made it to London and picked up another shipment heading down the English Channel to Lisbon. On the way down, they collided with another ship and sank it, but they were able to save the entire crew. Wait, what? They just um, fucking T-boned another boat and just sank it? Yeah, it wasn't the best launch. <laughs> it wasn't the best opening weekend. Yeah, for real. Because, like, first captain died immediately, <laughs> and then their first shipment to London, they just run into another ship and, <laughs> and capsize it. That's hilarious. Yeah. So this ship is, like, right out the gate plagued with tragedy. Although I suppose it's the 1800s. What, what wasn't out the gate plagued with tragedy at all fucking times, right? Yeah, pretty much everything was turmoil just constantly. <laughs> if, if something bad wasn't happening... Nothing was happening. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> not necessarily foreboding, but I mean, knowing what, no, huh? knowing what we know is going to happen to the ship. This is foreboding, you know. Yeah. <laughs> John Parker captained the ship for another two years, until William Thompson of the same company took over in 1863. Business continued on with nothing unusual happening until October of 1867. After setting off to pick up a cargo of coal in New York, the Amazon was hit with a terrible storm that drove the ship ashore. The damage was so severe that the company decided to abandon the ship completely. A few days later, William Thompson sold the wreckage to Alexander McBean, a man local to Glace Bay, the area where the ship had crashed. Within a month, McBean sold it to an unnamed businessman, who in turn sold it to an American mariner named Richard W. Haynes for $1,750. Haynes spent close to $9,000 restoring the ship, which is about $185,000 today, and registered it in New York under a new name, the Mary Celeste. Haynes would not be able to keep his new vessel for long, though. In October 1869, the ship was seized by creditors due to Haynes' sizable debt and was sold off to a consortium in New York, headed by James Winchester. There's no record of trade over the next three years, but during this time, the consortium paid $10,000 to refit the Mary Celeste, increasing her size and weight to 282 tons. The new captain was Benjamin Briggs, a 33% investor in the ship. Briggs was described as an intelligent and active shipmaster with good character, being respectable and responsible. Yeah, I love a good shipmaster. Also, what a name. If anyone is deserving of the role of captain for the Mary Celeste, it's Benjamin Briggs. Captain Benjamin Briggs. Captain Benjamin Briggs. That's good, dude. That, that's yeah. like straight out of like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean kind of kind of name. Right. Like, sounds like someone wrote a fictional pirate and named it. He is actually uh, came from a long line of a uh, shipsman. Shipsman. If that's a word. <laughs> shipmasters. <laughs> yeah, shipmasters. There you go. All right. Well, um, shipmaster Captain Benjamin Briggs, huh? His, his daddy, Captain Ships. <laughs> his grandpappy, Captain Ships. His great-grandpappy, Captain Ships. And his great-grandpappy before him. I actually don't know that. Maybe. Oh. The first new voyage of the Mary Celeste was to deliver a cargo of 1,700 barrels of alcohol to a winery in Genoa, Italy. Briggs traveled to New York to oversee the ship's cargo load himself, and a week later, his wife Sarah and daughter Sophia would join him. Aside from his family, Briggs had a small hand-picked crew of seven trusted men to accompany him on the voyage that were said to be peaceable and first-class sailors. But when the ship departed that November, it was the last time any of them were seen or heard from again. It was the afternoon of December 4th, 1872, 
When the ship De Gradia would reach a midway point between the Azores and the coast of Portugal, they spotted a vessel about six miles away, sailing unsteadily towards them. A vessel they would learn was the Mary Celeste. Due to the erratic movement and a flapping sail in the wind, Captain Morehouse of the De Gradia presumed the ship was in distress, and ordered his men to sail towards it. They hailed and signaled the Mary Celeste, but received no response. Three men then boarded the ship to find it deserted. On the deck, the sails were in poor condition, the rigging was damaged, and there was space for a single lifeboat, which was missing. The interior of the cabin was wet and slightly slightly askew, but was otherwise in good order. However, all of the windows had been battened up. Down below, the galley was neatly organized, with months of provisions and fresh water remaining. There was about a meter of water in the hold, but was manageable for a ship of this size, and it was not taking on any additional water. Many personal effects were found aboard, but the navigational equipment such as a chronometer, sextant, and a navigation book were missing. As they continued their investigation, they found the ship's log with the final entry dated November 25th, nine days before the discovery. The recorded position was off the coast of Santa Maria Island in the Azores, almost 400 nautical miles away. The crew found no indication of violence and described the ship as seaworthy and was almost like a new vessel. Okay, so if they like abandoned the ship, you'd expect the captain to at least like leave a fucking note or like write something in the log that gets left behind. Exactly, right? That's that's why everyone thinks right. that, you know, it had to be whatever happened happened real quick, yeah, real it had sudden, to be. and they had to just, you know, just dart out of there. What? My money's on cracking. Yeah, I think, I think they got crackened. Um, that's the most plausible. Yeah, say a group of them managed to like dislodge with one of the lifeboats and get going, yeah. and the kraken is just like nah, and then yoinks the lifeboat. I mean, that would explain why the lifeboat's gone, right? True. Yeah, never found. Oh, the lifeboat was never found, huh? No. Oh, I think it got crackened. After some deliberation, Captain Morehouse sent his first mate, Oliver DeVoe, and two crewmen to take charge of the Mary Celeste and bring it to Gibraltar, in which it arrived just over a week later, on December 13th. Once the De Gradia and Mary Celeste reached Gibraltar, Captain Morehouse reported his findings to the Atlantic Mutual Insurance Company, stating, Found forth and brought here. Mary Celeste abandoned seaworthy. Admiralty and post. Notify all parties. Telegraph offer of salvage. Morehouse. Meanwhile, the United States Consul, Horatio Sprague, contacted the Board of Underwriters in New York. Brig, Mary Celeste here derelict. Important. Send power attorney to claim her from Admiralty Court. The court expedited the process, and the Chief Justice of Gibraltar, Sir James Cochran, called for the proceedings just four days later on December 17th. Frederick Solly Flood, who was the Attorney General of Gibraltar, and acted on behalf of the Queen's Royal Navy, was the chief investigator on the case, and ordered two men to examine the ship. Shipping surveyor John Austin to investigate the ship itself, and an experienced diver named Ricardo Portonado to inspect the hull of the ship beneath the waterline. Austin concluded that there were no signs of bad weather, and stated, I'm wholly unable to discover any reason whatsoever why why the said vessel should have been abandoned. However, at first, he did find some interesting things of note. There were cuts on the bow of the ship that Austin thought to be man-made, and strange stains that were believed to be blood found on the ship's railing and on the captain's sword that was sheathed in the cabin. This fueled Flood to wildly speculate foul play from every direction. This is going to start Flood's descent into madness almost because Fuck he's yeah. like, he is so sure that something fucked up happened here. Hell he's yeah. going to get to the bottom of it, <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, he never will. <laughs> So there's there's like cuts on the ship. There's there's blood stains. I mean, it's like all signs um, point to Kraken already. Yeah, yeah uh, true. The the cuts in the in the ship. Or I don't suppose any of them were like cylindrical, like sucker shaped, were they? Didn't say. I'm gonna wildly conjecture that they were. Kraken. Kraken. The fate of the Mary Celeste. Kraken. They got krakened. James Winchester, the majority owner of the ship, arrived in Gibraltar on January 15th to inquire about the ship and its cargo. Flood demanded a $15,000 bond from Winchester to claim the ship, money which he did not have. He also learned that Flood suspected him of having Captain Briggs and his family and crew killed, possibly for insurance fraud. Later, his official report would blame the crew for drinking alcohol from the cargo and murdering Briggs and his family in a drunken rage. Imagine sailing for like three months over to like claim your ship and then all of a sudden this dude is accusing you of having your crew murdered <laughs> yeah. and charging you $15,000 to get your ship back. What's his reasoning for this like $15,000 charge? Because that's like more than anyone else has put into this fucking boat up to this point, right? He wanted a reason to keep the investigation going. At least that's what I think. Yeah, because that That'd be like the equivalent of like what, like three hundred grand? Yeah. So like, I, I, I think he just put a huge, just unrealistic bond on it, just to, um, that no one could pay, so that he could just keep, you know, investigating keep, it. Keep looking at it. I see. Yeah, that's gotcha. what I think anyway. So he's just a madman. He wants to get to the root of this before yeah. anyone can take it away from yeah. him. Yeah. 
The claims were soon dismissed by the court though, as Dr. J. Patron analyzed the sword and determined that there was no blood on the blade, and another naval investigator concluded the damage to the ship's timbers was due to natural causes from being unmanned at sea. Flood still remained confident that there was foul play at work though, unable to accept the fact that the ship could have drifted almost 400 miles on its own. But after much deliberation and lack of evidence, he eventually released the ship to Winchester on February 25th. The crew of the De Gradia was only awarded 1,700 British pounds, a small fraction of what the ship and cargo were worth at the time, estimated to be around 42,000. Rumors and speculation quickly spread through the media at the time. One of the first articles published about the event in the Shipping and Commercial List newspaper echoed Flood's theory about alcohol being the cause. The New York Times suggested it could have been pirates, but some publications would continue the popular narrative of the crew murdering the captain's family and escaping, while others would cite the fabled Flying Dutchman and that the crew was whisked away to Davy Jones' locker. Over the years, many individuals would attempt to capitalize on the story and attest that they were the last survivor, giving fantastical accounts of the story to anyone that would listen. One man in 1913 claimed that the whole crew fell into the sea while watching a swimming contest between some of the sailors, and everyone was almost immediately eaten by sharks. Others would claim that the crew was picked off the deck by a giant squid, and some said the ship was the subject of a psychic attack from the Pyramid of Giza or even the Bermuda Triangle. It was a subject to a psychic attack from the Pyramid of Giza. What the fuck does that mean? What? Who <laughs> put that one forward? That was a. I know, like a lot of people were spitballing here. That guy was fucking spitballing though. But yeah, dude. Like other people said, it was alien abductions uh, later on. Uh -huh. um, some people thought that it was like um, Atlantean warriors came up from Atlantis and took the ship because they like got too close to their city or something. Incredible. Um, they thought that they happened upon their own derelict ship. Okay. Like, uh, Benjamin Briggs and his whole crew found another derelict ship, and then with a bunch of treasure on it, they <laughs> abandoned the Mary Celeste, got on that ship, and then they lived the rest of their lives in Spain. Hey, I was actually there. I was the, the only person that survived the Mary Celeste, prove me wrong. Um, and uh, it was a Kraken. I saw it all happen. Uh, they yeah. all got dragged down uh, by the Kraken to join Davy Jones' crew, because I was there. I survived. Can I write this down? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and write it down. Can and, I publish uh, it? Publish it as complete fact. Okay, cool. No need to fact check me at all. It is, yeah. I wouldn't lie to you. Aside from the ridiculous nature of most of the claims, more realistic theories would start to emerge throughout modern times. It was once believed that a water spout or submarine earthquake may have been the culprit, causing faulty instrument readings to lead Briggs to abandon the ship in fear of it submerging. However, our most probable theory comes from a study in 2006 conducted by Dr. Andrea Sella of the UCL's Department of Chemistry. The theory being that a leak from one of the alcohol barrels in the cargo may have caught fire and exploded, which caused a mass panic on the ship. Dr. Sella built a replica of the Mary Celeste cargo hold and simulated an explosion with butane gas to mimic an alcohol leak, but instead of wooden barrels, he used cubes of paper. The gas caused a pressure wave explosion and sent a ball of flame upwards, but it left behind cool air with the replica hold and paper cubes left unscathed, not even any soot or scorching. Dr. Sella stated, the explosion would have been enough to blow open the hatches and would have been terrifying for everyone on board. It is the most compelling explanation. Of all those suggested, it fits the facts the best and explains why they were so keen to get off the ship. Okay, that theory makes sense. I still think it was a Kraken. Do you think someone paid off the Sella guy to conduct this? What do you think? To like to throw us off the trail of a Kraken? Do you think Davy Jones paid him off? Do we know that this guy isn't on Davy Jones' payroll? This guy's like a, like a half sea creature um, uh, scientist that uh, is very clearly working for, for Davy Jones. Yeah, and um, he's slowly becoming part of the ship. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Davy Jones lets him uh, loose every once in a while to dispel the Mary Celeste theories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the only reason he lets him on land is to go like disprove it. Yeah, because Davy Jones has a lot to lose if people figure it out. <laughs> totally, yeah. No, none of these theories like are seem strong enough to to like scare an entire crew of like you know seaworthy hardened sailors. Y you would think their their immediate instinct would be save the ship, you know, because that's yeah. that's their fucking lifeline to get home. And that's one of the most uh, interesting things about this is that even the most plausible theory just it doesn't really make just, sense. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, because. Why would he abandon the ship? It if doesn't. Everything yeah, was cool. Totally, it doesn't make sense. Like, why would he just bail? I don't get it. Yeah. Or. Crack. Crack. Yeah. Kraken? Kraken. Kraken. I think it was a Kraken. Oh, it's pretty. I think yeah. this is a pretty cut and dry case, yeah. man. I think. All right. Bump the night. We blew the lid off this case. We <laughs> solved it. We blown it wide open. <laughs> it was a Kraken. They definitely got Krakened. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Any one of these could explain the disappearance of Captain Briggs and his crew, albeit some more plausible than others. But what happened to the ship itself? 
Two weeks after James Winchester received the Mary Celeste back from Admiralty Court, he was able to scrounge up a crew to finally complete its delivery to Genoa. She lay vacant until February the next year, when Winchester and his consortium eventually sold the ship at a considerable loss to another New York businessman. All of the notoriety surrounding the ship made it a very unpopular vessel to man, and rightfully so, as the ship continued her streak of misfortune. Over the next few years, the ship would mostly sail routes to the Indian Ocean, while usually losing money on each journey. In February 1879, the then-captain Edgar Tuthel fell ill during his shipment, and died on the island of St. Helena after landing there to seek medical attention. This further perpetuated that the ship was cursed, as Tuthel was the third captain to die under her command. The following year, the ship would be sold again to a group of Bostonians headed by Wesley Gove. The ship was helmed by Captain Thomas Fleming until 1884, when Gilman Parker took over and the Mary Celeste would finally meet her unceremonious end. Parker conspired with a group of fellow Bostonians to commit insurance fraud, ironic as this is the same offense that the previous owner James Winchester was accused of. They filled the ship with nearly worthless cargo, which they mislabeled on the manifest and insured the goods for $30,000, roughly $900,000 today. They set out for Port-au-Prince, Haiti, but when they reached a well-charted and large coral reef off the coast of a nearby Haitian island, Parker ran the ship into the reef, causing irreparable damage to the hull. He then sold the salvageable cargo to the American consul in Haiti for $500 and filed an insurance claim. The consul later reported that the cargo he was brought was almost worthless, and the ship's insurers began investigating. Parker was originally charged with conspiracy to commit insurance fraud and baritry, but eventually the judge negotiated an arrangement where the defendants would withdraw the claim and repay any money they had received. Parker would die in poverty three months later, while one of his co-defendants went mad and another killed himself, forever sealing the reputation of the Mary Celeste as a cursed ghost ship. Oh, those wacky rap scallions and their insurance yeah. fraud. I like that you, you put in there that he died in poverty. <laughs> Even without the the wild claims, the history of the ship's pretty interesting. Yeah, there really it's is. Like, no one really goes into like all the just crazy details, yeah. which is what I like. I'm, I like crazy details. I like the crazy details. I'm glad we dug yeah. into this one. This was a, this was a fun story. The names were so good in this one. Exactly. Rip and peace, Horatio Sprague. R Rip and, and peace. Ricardo Portnado. Ricardo Portnado, Horatio Sprague. Benjamin Brett, Briggs. Benjamin Briggs. That was a good one. But he might still be kicking around out there because you know, Flying Dutchman. That's going to solidify uh, my my final theory. It was I'm gonna I want to say it was the Kraken because I, I, my heart wants to believe that Benjamin Briggs is out there uh, on the Flying Dutchman, you know, uh, claiming more souls for Davy Jones. I like that. I like that too. That sounds nice. Yeah, confirmed. Benjamin Briggs is a part of Davy Jones' crew. Confirmed. Eternally serving him. Krakened. Krakened. What do you think happened to the infamous Mary Celeste? Was there really an explosion in the hull to induce a mass panic? Did the crew go mad and murder the captain and his family? Or perhaps the ship was attacked by some sort of giant sea monster? Or even visited by Davy Jones's Flying Dutchman? Regardless of how many theories we can come up with, we'll never know what truly happened the fateful day when the legendary ghost ship was left abandoned. That's why the story of the Mary Celeste continues on as one of the greatest maritime mysteries. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Ghoul School. If you like what you see, please consider checking out our channel where we upload videos weekly. And be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to keep up with all things that go bump in the night.